Oh, that's so important. It's all about relationship. That's what qualitative inquiry is about, isn't it? Well, it, it, I don't care who you are, you have to live in the world. Well, it's our ritual. Homage. It is our yeah. ritual. Yeah. It's really asking an awful lot of a researcher to be reflexive, <laughs> now I come to think about it. So I first met Tony Adams at the first Congress of Qualitative Inquiry in May 2005. It was a big was. trip for us. Yeah, expensive trip. <laughs> um, but it was really worth going, you were right. Um, and I can remember very vividly actually the seats yeah. just down the front of the room, front row, this colourful man in a Hawaiian shirt looking very healthy and not like an academic at all, who later turned out, I realised, to be Art Bochner waving everyone down the front row and I'm like, no way, I'm not coming down the front of this. It's like everyone knows each other here. Scary. Um, so I took a place at the back and I can't remember which paper on that session it was. And it was an autoethnography and narrative, I think, session. Yeah. It was Tony Adams. What, what drew you to that session? I think it was actually that morning reading through, like we wrote about in the history of autoethnographic inquiry chapter. This uh -huh. was a key moment in my awakening to autoethnography as a research method mm. was reading Tony's abstract where he talked about yeah. used the word golf and gay in the same sentence uh -huh. you know, one of the things game. Tony's work and I hope my own efforts around autoethnography and same-sex attraction are bringing things out that wouldn't be raised in an it's for an example an interview situation so the sort of taboo nature. So this changed all that for you? Well, what Tony's wow. doing here is he's taking us back to his child, childhood and his, mm. to moments when he hadn't talked, as I understand it from the book, when he hadn't shared this either. Mm. And I can, through autoethnography, we are able to do that. We are able to open up about things mm -hmm. that we can't ask others about. Mm. You know, I, writing about um, school experiences in school physical education like mm. ethically it's really dodgy it would be mm. difficult to go and interview children about that mm. even if they would open up and be, feel safe to talk is it fair to do so yes whereas Tony's yeah. actually taken us back to his childhood here and we're getting an insight into things that wouldn't have mm -hmm. otherwise been brought to the table so that only has used stories recreations of moments, little fragments mm. of narrative mm. to take me as a reader into Absolutely. those times in his adolescence. I mean, for me, your work and Tony's has taken me into scenes that I could never have gone on my own. Like so, a men's changing room. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> With um, men in it. it exa Naked men. Yes, exactly that. Miracle of modern technology. Cut to Tony and your conversation at the University of Illinois in the oh, May yeah, 2016 year. Go straight to the horse's mouth. Was that your first book? That was my first book. Pretty powerful. <laughs> Thank you. First. It took a long time to write, a few years. Uh, six years. Six years. Six years to write. Um, but a work of Briefly, can you just tell me about what you're doing now, your, your research, your ongoing project? Uh, my current project is on narrating forgiveness. Uh, forgiveness and how forgiveness happens in context of sexuality and sexual orientation, especially uh, gay, lesbian, queer identities. Um, I, there, there are um, two big parts of it. I'm looking at how do we, how do we live with ourselves, with the harms we've inflicted because of sexuality. And I also want to ask the question, how do we live with others who have inflicted harms on us because of sexuality? So two parts uh, to this. In my past, I have dated women mm -hmm. um, before, and this was in moments where I was confused and struggling with my, my, my same-sex attraction. Mm -hmm. And these are women, one woman in particular, um, I really hurt her for mm -hmm. four years of my life, mm -hmm. of, of being distant with her mm -hmm. and taking up four years of her life because of my struggles. And these were, these were my struggles, even, but they were her struggles mm -hmm. because we are in a relationship yes, together. How do I live with myself yes. knowing that I did that? How do I live, now the flip side, how do I live with, um, how do I live with a mother who, uh, who or a father uh, who has harmed me with 
terrible stuff they have said about sexuality. Um, I, they may have said what terrible stuff that may have been said 15 years ago. And I can deal with that moment. So, okay, my father reacted to me in this way 15 years ago. And maybe I can work through that reaction. But what happens when he keeps doing it? Uh -huh. These mundane, everyday moments uh -huh. where the harms happen. How do I live with family members who do that uh -huh. still and have done so for decades? What is that threshold? How do I forgive them? And it's not as easy as saying, oh, I forgive you. And then they harm me again. And, oh, I forgive you. And then they harm me again. Oh, I forgive you. No. We have, it has to be, it's complicated. Mm -hmm. And that's my next, mm -hmm. next big process. We have to figure out how we how work we with it, it in, in ethical ways. Yeah. Um, um, Carolyn Ellis is working a lot in this uh, area with compassionate interviewing. Mm -hmm. she's, she's lit, she, her participants are her, uh, so, there's so, no separation. Yeah, so, when, so when you do interviews, for example, which is one very, very traditional um, qualitative research method for collecting data. What's in the back of your mind? What are you, what are you thinking about? What's important to you? <laughs> uh, I want it to be invitational. And I want to say, I'm working on this project. Um, I struggle. Some people I would say, if you are interested in talking with me, let me know. Um, I even want to go one step further and say, I'm working on this project and putting it out into the world, mm -hmm. and if people contact me, mm -hmm. I want to start there. Mm -hmm. So I want this to be a very invitational, I want it to start with the participant rather than assume. Next step, I transcribe the interview, send you the interview, sit and ask any changes you want to make, any, any additions, corrections, edits. Can I just pause you there again? Because what I think we find certainly in sports sciences when interviews are used, and when I'm reviewing papers, <laughs> Everybody sends it back and nobody ever makes any changes. Right, absolutely. Yes. No. So I'm, I'm wondering, well, what for me is more important is the next step, what you do with that. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> and how absolutely. invested in your research were the participants in the first place? Absolutely. Right. That's the, that's the step, I think, that that's what for uh, many qualitative researchers I know as, um, draw the line, that I sent you the transcript of the interview, you say, yes, um, because I, I haven't said, got any time to read it, I, 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 <laughs> I can't, it, well, I don't a, have time a, to read all of that. Absolutely, then yeah. there's another burden on the, you know, that's a burden on the, the, the participant too, yeah. that somebody, I live my life teaching classes and writing, yes. that somebody who is working yes. 50 to 60 hours a week, what gives me that right to, hey, yeah. can you spend more time yeah. on this project yeah. that I'm going to benefit from yes. and I need it for my career? And, to get it. this is that next step that they also need to get a say that I need to yeah. I need to at least find a way to do my best to um, try to then send the next document yeah. and, and yeah. whether that's the book or the journal article yeah. to participants saying here's how I'm framing what you said here are the old the, here are the selected quotes yes um, this is this is this is by this is where I mean, all studies come in and bias. I mean, people use yeah. different words. They take parts of the interview and not all mm. the parts of the interview. And then, if the participant at that time, the interviewee says, oh, I hate what you do with my words, and they want to pull it, they have that right. Yeah. Where it gets finalized is in print, mm. because then it's, then it's permanent. And that's mm. the harder, harder mm. space. And how, I mean, uh, again, in, while I'm reviewing, often responses to reviewers people will tell me or students or whoever the, the paper's from, they will often say something like, well, I didn't have time to go back or it was too costly, you know, this is a really important area and I just, you know, needed to get this finished. What would be your responses to those colleagues? If, I, 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 for me, that would be the context and the project. If that was a, if that was a, um, that was a student working on a student paper for a class. There's one project. Dissertation, final thesis project, that's another project. Journal article is another project. If the student at the end of the class said that, it's too costly, I don't have enough time, but they put in a few measures up, you know, yes. ethical measures, that's fine. Uh, that, because if they don't do anything with it, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm more likely to say, yes. that's okay. Yes. Um, because probably that those words won't ever go into the world in, yes. in particular ways. It gets a bit more tricky with the thesis or dissertation. 
can we find ways, you know, to do our best to accommodate, mm. you know, um, this group. Um, with the journal article book, I don't think, if that's the excuse, that's not a valid excuse. Or I'm, as the reviewer, going to say, are you kidding? You don't have to publish this journal. Nobody is pressuring you to publish this journal article or book. Is it for that's promotion? Good, yeah. I mean, if yeah. it's for, pro if that's the only thing you're working, you could, if, that, if that's the only thing you're working on, and then and that's the thing that's going to get you promotion, mm -hmm. um, or t tenure, mm -hmm. um, that's not an that's mm -hmm. not a valid mm -hmm. excuse. You could do other projects that could. See, see, uh, alongside that, we've had experiences where, um, for example, uh, in abusive situations, some of our female participants don't want to revisit domestic Absolutely. violence again. Right. They've said, we've given you this story, we're happy for you to use it, but we just want to try and put that behind us and we hope the story makes some Perfect. D good in the world, Perfect. but I can't invest in that. Perfect, good. Hmm. I think that has to be acknowledged yes. as the writer or the yes. researcher, and I think that's that's where it's ethics are situational. And hmm. that that's, yeah. if that's, if that's, if the researcher feels as though that is accurate, and yes. you know, I still believe some researchers will make that up. Really? Yeah, I do. I think they would make something like they didn't go back and ask them, and so they would put something in their leg. Okay. I don't think these women would want to revisit. It. Okay. No. If they yeah. told you that. Yeah. Sure. Um, yeah. So you'd be skeptical sometimes. Sometimes, you know, it depends on who, yeah. who, who the per you know, how the person talks and yes. uses that information. Yes. We get into really difficult, and, and from an art, from an art space perspective, yes. something something that I really appreciate about your work. Mm -hmm. um, I also have the question about accessibility, yeah. and uh, human subjects forms or institutional review boards. The consent forms are so terrible. Yes. They're terrible. They're filled with <laughs> jargon. Yes. Um, what do I do when I work with a population? who is only functionally literate. Mm -hmm. So not only yeah. um, do I have these informed consent forms, mm -hmm. I might talk with them and they might be great storytellers, yeah. yeah. but what if I send them a transcript? Yes. What if I send them the journal article or the book and they can't read it? Mm -hmm. They don't know how to read it. Does that absolve me mm -hmm. from, oh, well, it's too bad. Mm -hmm. um, that's, no, it's not. Mm -hmm. And I know a, a project currently that, that tackles those questions mm -hmm. and this is uh, she does a great job with this is Robin Boyler and Sweetwater uh -huh. okay. uh, black women and narratives of resilience a great book and she worries about you know she wrote this book but the people of her community the black women she worked with may not be able to access this yes. book in print yeah. she wants to do an audio version Wonderful. Um, music is a way uh -huh. to to yeah. to get into you know the spaces to take take that research back uh, and people might not here's the other even additional part to that people might not even tell you that they're functionally literate because they yes. might feel some shame. Absolutely, yeah. And that even gets, that has yeah. another tricky dimension. Yeah. So if I give you a journal article and I interview you and you are not understanding what I'm doing with it because you've never seen a journal article before, you, can't, you, don't, you can't access it, you might say, oh, it's fine. Yeah. And we may never know, we may, as a researcher, but I think these are, I live, I carry these. issues. Yes, yes and I carry these carry. around. get into those spaces of figuring out how to how to talk about how to study this concept of homophobia I can talk with I could talk with therapists about mm -hmm. the stories that they've heard mm -hmm. from their clients about how homophobia has affected their lives um, I could do surveys with with uh, youth about homophobia I can also tell you myself so I can ask you about how your family is lived but I don't I'm not in your body I can't experience what you experience I can tell you the homophobia that I have experienced in my family and dare I say I can tell you I am current I'm 37 years old I can tell I can write about homophobia in my life in ways that no interviewer could ever capture because I've lived it for 30 all of my life, um, but at least in Tobia. Yeah. And that's where qualitative research comes, comes in for me. What can we accomplish yeah. with certain methods? What can we do in a focus group? What can we do when we ask somebody's mm -hmm. story? What can we do if I tell my personal story? What does my personal story grant you that other people could never get to? Mm.
how do we study domestic violence or, uh -huh. or yes. how, how can we we can't set up that experiment to mm -hmm. To, yes. to and it's not it's not ethical to do so. And it's not <laughs> ethical. We haven't even got <laughs> Would you to just the ethics. Beat yet? your wife Would for a moment. You? Absolutely, so that we can and observe it. Yeah. it. There's the issue that how do we get into that's an important social issue. Mm. And so what is, we we can't get in there with an experiment, mm. but we got we we better be studying it. Yeah. You know. So when I think about the importance of insider knowledge and and a, examples of it, I think of your work with uh, writing about professional golf and. Um, your experiences with hi good morning good, good morning. morning good morning good morning I, 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 I pet you a kiss thank you <laughs> how do I set up an experiment to study um, uh, athletes and competition how do I set up that experiment how do I get access to somebody in the professional golfing world hey can I walk around with you and study what you do I still can't get in your feelings I can't I can't tap into what you were how you are feeling and your moments of struggle and tension and exhaustion and that's one thing that I see in your work that it's that it speaks to the exhaustion that happens mm. and I can't get that I can't get that with surveys so one of the things I really like that um, Tony talks about in the film is the ethics of interviewing. Because mm. that's a big issue for all of our research. Mm. Avoiding taking, plundering people's lives. Yes. Taking their yes. stories. Yes, and that's something a... Kim talked about as well, mining people mm. as if there's, you know, you just get it all out of them. Yeah, I mean, I really like that idea that, he just, that he's talked about there about collaborative mm. interviewing yes so even when the interview even if we are using interview approaches which do have this historical baggage yes um, there are ways of interacting and relating with a participant yeah. that aren't plundering yeah. that are actually not the researcher going in looking for what the researcher wants or needs or thinks they want or need but actually trying to open to that participant to talk about their life experience. And that's been so important, the collaboration, that's been so important with our early studies, mm. for me with the mental health, okay, yeah. these people, they're redirecting me to what matters in yes. my life as a man with schizophrenia. Mm. It's not as explicit as that, but that's what's going on. Mm. Somehow I was able, even as a novice positive researcher, to work in that way, mm. I think. And you did, I know, with your participants. Mm -hmm. and mm. You were open to them, directing you mm -hmm. to what mattered in their lives. Mm. And that... oh, totally. I mean, in professional sport, I had no clue that my participants would talk about self-harming, attempted suicide, alcohol misuse, um, sexual abuse, rape. It just wasn't on the cards if those participants hadn't wanted to raise those issues mm -hmm. my questions wouldn't have got it out of them no but on the other hand if you hadn't been open to them them yes these is relevant so it's it's opening the phrase you've used of field of relevance is yeah. it opening art as a researchers yeah to what is relevant is opening and opening and opening yeah. to the point that it's 360 degrees hopefully yeah. And it's it's focused on that person that we're working, you know, mm. uh, that we're in a relationship collaborating with. Mm. What Tony talked about right there, right there, was this idea of actually even introducing the study in that way. So inviting people yes. to, to come and work with me on mm. this. Is, I'm interested in this. We, we want to sort of understand this better. The forgiveness. I mean, that's a hugely complex area that affects us all. Yes. So you know, let's you know if you. Would you be up to doing, you know, mm. working in that way, which to me is ethically, you know, feels good and it, it, it's quite appeeling. Yeah, it does feel good.